I'm, uh, my name is Da Zhi Ho, and I am previously worked in SiteLab AMR Taohu University, but my contract just ended last month. So from the next month, I think I will, I will uh, work for the USTC China. But technically, I'm not employed, so thanks for making my holiday very uh, academic again. So, so first I would like to introduce why we're going to do the spin transporting and ferromagnet insulators and uh, we'll actually we'll try to realize the spin current switching in this kind of material. And, uh, and then we'll talk about uh, the, some two works uh, just published uh, in the last few years. And before the conclusion, I would like to talk about some kind of uh, puzzles and challenges now we have. The first thing is that if we look at the charge uh, application, so we know that uh, actually because we have some conductor and we can make something like the light uh, very useful when it, uh, when it was first invented. But if further we can realize switching off a charge current, we can make transistors. So this is one of the kind of uh, most useful device in nowadays life. But transistor actually in this form is not kind of a very new uh, if you consider the idea for uh, uh, current switching. Because just to look at this kind of ancient computer, then you realize that actually people can realize the current switching by this kind of diode tube uh, actually very easily. Just to control the uh, voltage in, the, in this grid. You can actually realize the current control. But actually people uh, later on figure out actually you can do the same thing with in this modern transistor based on semiconductors. And this actually allows you to put so many transistors in a very con small area. And that gives rise to all the kind of nowadays electronics product we are now using. But I have to say the human being is really kind of a greedy creature. So we kind of increasingly to try to put, it some, put uh, more and more transistors into one uh, device. So later on, actually, the power consumption become a really problem. So we have pretty severe heating problem. This, uh, yeah, this is kind of a kind of um, office cooking, right? But and another thing is that the battery actually is another limit for the heating. So we really need some kind of a power uh, uh, friendly and more green technique to overcome this kind of uh, heating problem. So uh, spin current actually appear to be a quite kind of attractive uh, solution for this kind of heating problem. Because if you consider the flow of charge current, so inevitably you will have drill heating. But if you look at the spin current, so which means that you, the spin is go, one spin up go this way and the other spin down go the, the other way. So actually the angular momentum flow conceptually costs much less uh, energy. Uh, so, but if you talk about uh, spin current, in addition to many useful spin-related uh, um, phenomena invented, so actually one thing people actually dream of is to make spin transistor. So, the, which means that you can somehow have a uh, spin, uh, spin uh, uh, type of a transistor, uh, which is much more energy friendly. So, the first. Proposal of the spin transistor made by Dust and Data actually is based on semiconductor uh, material. But actually, during I think for over 30 uh, years of development, so the progress actually is not very kind of prog uh, promising. And people also come up with other idea to get a spin current in uh, combining 2D material like this. But all of this kind of uh, energies and uh, effort is putting the conducting material. So, but actually we, if the, actually we can have the, some uh, insulator also conducting spin current, so we, we may have another chance to have a different solution. So this actually, I think the breakthrough is made by the Ohio group, and Professor Yang is also here. And his group show uh, in 2014 is that if you put a uh, nickel oxide, which is insulating any from magnet between yik and platinum. So he, you, he find that if you pump a spin current by spin uh, by microwave from yik into platinum and measure the inverse spin Hall effect. 
he finds that compared to the bilayer sample, the trilayer sample actually also show a very quite obvious signal due to spin transmission through the antiferon magnet insulator. And even uh, more exciting is that he finds that this uh, even have some amplification <coughs> compared to the bilayer device. And very soon, that uh, the Kyoto group also reproduced the same uh, uh, pretty similar uh, result, and the transparency is still pr pretty good. And then the Ohio group also started to look at the different materials. He, uh, so he sh they showed that actually in uh, many much antiferromagnetic insulator, you can really uh, realize the spin transmission. So just the, the efficiency and the decay lengths are different. So this work actually inspires us a lot, because it means that spin current can go through antiferromagnetic insulator in which there is no electrons. So this actually is a very different uh, trance compared to the previous conducting material. So this is our starting point. So our experiment is basically pretty similar to the Ohio group. So we uh, just, uh, based on the spin pumping technique, use an uh, ferromagnetic insulator YIG as a spin injector, and we put some material on it to inject the spin and then pick up the um, inverse spin hot factor by uh, the voltage here. So I think uh, we have uh, two questions to answer in this kind of uh, direction. So first is that, so what mediates the spin current in and from mass insulator? So this is a kind of uh, the thing, the first thing you have to understand for the next step development. So the second is that how we realize a spin current switch. So the first thing uh, we do is that we just uh, kind of mimic the Ohio group. So we grow cobalt oxide uh, on YIG and then co cover it with one layer of platinum. So this is, uh, so this, with this device, we can inject a spin current from YIG to cobalt oxide and uh, detect the, the transmission. So cobalt oxide is chosen for, uh, because the, the new temperature is a little bit lower, so we can do it in uh, a big range of thickness. So, so the first data we see in the experiment is that we have a, a microwave absorption due to FMR and the corresponding inverse spin half act. So when we see this, we know that the spin current is, uh, basically goes through the antiferromagnetic insulator here. And then we just uh, do this uh, measurement in a, a very big range of temperature. And we find that uh, although the uh, microwave trans, uh, absorption basically is the same, but actually you can see the inverse spin effect is very different. So it's kind of small at room temperature, but an increase to a big value in, for some intermediate temperature and drop to nearly zero. So if we plot the peak value against the temperature, it looks like something like this. And compared to the bilayer sample, so obviously there is something very different happening here. <coughs> so actually, we, if we look at the reference, uh, so which is on the susceptibility of the uh, very thin cobalt oxide film, and we find that these two are pretty similar. And uh, uh, obviously, we try to guess that maybe it's this peak related to the near temperature of this material. And then we just do the same thing. We change the thickness of cobalt oxide, and we find that the, thickness, the peak does show a shift to the high, uh, a larger thickness. So this is pretty consistent with this kind of behavior. And then we try this in a different material. We change the cobalt oxide into nickel oxide. So basically, they are very similar compound, but nickel oxide is of a much higher uh, near temperature. But when we control the thickness pretty thin to 1.5 nanometer, so we see very similar behavior. So uh, the last question actually of this project is where the TC? So in the beginning actually of our experimentalist, we pretty kind of easily think, okay, this should be the TC, right? But actually our collaborator, Joe Bucker, now working in UK, he actually commented that uh, maybe TC is here, yeah, or here, you never know, right? So this is pretty critical. So we, then we went to 
we realize that we have to do XMLD to uh, pin down this issue. Then we contact the kind of uh, one of the uh, expert working at UC Berkeley. So, and together with uh, the post of him at that time, now he's professor in Peking University, Jia Li, and they actually had developed a lot of uh, kind of a matured uh, XMLD measurement technique. So we measure this carboxide uh, fume and we find the, you do see some XMLD contrast in the antiferon magnet phase, but it's pretty, it's much smaller than the, the single crystal samples. But still it allows you to determine the near temperature to be this value. And if you compare this value to the, the transport data, basically, okay, our guess is correct. But now we're pretty confident that this is, uh, <coughs> so we can use this, uh, the spin transmission to probe the new, vector, uh, new temperature of this antiferon magnet layer. And also it brings us another important message is, so actually the spin transmission in antiferon magnet insulator depending on the thermal excitation. Because if you just lower the temperature to kind of five Kelvin, you don't have any transmission. So which means that if you want spin current to go through uh, like antiferon insulator, you need some excitation to mediate it. So this is pretty important for us because it tell, we kind of uh, lay, believe that the, it, is, it is the magnum mediate all the spin tr transport in antiferon insulator. So this is actually pretty important for us to solve this, uh, to make the second thing happen. So, so how to make a, a spin current switch. So then we look at the symmetry of the spin current and charge current again. And we realize something different in symmetry. So for a charge current, basically the spin orientation is not specified. So basically it's isotropic spatially. But if you talk about spin current some, like this, so actually the spatial symmetry has a little bit broken because you have specified spin orientation. So this means that this is not, uh, is kind of an isotropic cu uh, current to the space. So why this is important? Because if you look at the principle of design valve, you realize some, some chance here. So usually we have the valve something uh, like this. So we control the cross section of the, this channel. So if the channel is, the, this is big, so you go through, but if this uh, cross section is very small, you break, basically block everything. But if the particle is anisotropic, so okay, what I want to say is just imagine this is spin current. So actually you have, a you have an alternative design to make it evolve. So different from changing the cross section of the, um, like this, so actually you can just rotate the cross section, this channel uh, like 90 degree here. So this actually blocks the particle effect effectively. So the first type of valve may be called a flux valve, like a faucet we use every day. But the second type of valve can be considered as a structural valve. So light, pretty like the, uh, the light polarizer in optics. So for spin current, so actually uh, the situation is very different for conventional metal system and a max ferromagnet, uh, antiferromagnet insulator. Because for convention like metal system like gold, so if you put a spin current into this material, so we realize that this material is pretty isotropic. So this material can conduct a spin no matter where the spin are uh, pointing to. But if you look at the antiferrum insulator with a well-defined new vector, and then you realize that only you can put spin parallel to this new vector that you can realize uh, excite an uh, eigenvalue of the, this kind of traveling magna can bring the spin from here to here. So this is pretty much uh, explained in this illustration. So if you put the spin in the wrong direction, for example, here it's perpendicular to the new vector. So actually it will excite the same um, disturb of the two sub lattice. So end up, so this di disturbance will quickly die in a very short distance. But if you put it in the spin in, in the right direction, so actually it will decrease the coangle of the red sub lattice and increase the coangle of the 
booster bladders. So this pre like an eigen uh, eigenstate of the traveling magnet. So this can very likely give you an on state. So when we go through all of this, we reach a, a central idea is that spin current switching can be realized by new vector rotation in this kind of insulator system. So the next step, we just uh, build up uh, our own uh, kind of device. So to realize this, so this is pretty kind of a, a trans similar, similar structure when we, like the one we used in previously. We grow chromium oxide on YIG and cover with a platinum uh, for this inverse spin detection. So the, the good thing here is that we can grow the uh, chromium oxide with the C-axis outer plane. So this C X outer plane ensures that the new vector is outer plane. So this actually will be orthogonal to the injection spin from, uh, from the YIG. So this actually makes sure that the spin current is really blocked below the new temperature of chromium oxide. So this is pretty uh, really true when we measure the temperature dependence of the inverse spin Hall effect in this device. We find that above the new temperature, you have some uh, uh, spin transmission, but it also goes down when you increase temperature, pretty similar to the cobalt oxide case. But if for the and for a magnet case, it's pretty effectively kind of goes to zero, just a little bit below the new temperature of this material. So this is pretty sharp transition. So this is very, very different from the case in cobalt oxide, so which you see a pretty kind of a broadened, non-sharp transition. So another thing is that we also uh, check a little bit. So first we insert one layer of uh, five nanometer of uh, co copper between YIG and uh, uh, chrome oxide. And then for this sample, we also see this kind of transition, but a little bit uh, not so sharp, but still basically <coughs> feature is there. And then we take away the, uh, the YIG as a crest by, I think by Helen, <laughs> to show that, okay, this, this effect is not related to the chrome oxide itself. Yes, you do need a spin injector here to, um, to realize this kind of spin uh, injection. Then we look at different thickness and uh, actually it's pretty consistent. So when the chrome oxide is very thin, so you don't have this sharp transition. So this means that this material may be not so very continuous. But when the chrome oxide reaches a certain thickness, so here is 75 nanometer, so the behavior is pretty the same for this one and for and the thicker films. So the problem now is that we're pretty sure that we switch off the spin current here, but now is that we need to switch on. <coughs> but, the, uh, but actually, if you look at it, you realize it's not very easy. So in the antiferromagnetic uh, state like this, you have a pretty uh, efficient spin current uh, switching are uh, broken because the orthogonal orientation between the new vector and the magnetization here. But if you align the magnetization out of plane, so you have collinear, so this tells you that you can have a very efficient spin injection. But at this time, the spin orientation and the spin injection uh, direction will be the same. So you don't have inver inverse spin half act. But if you align this in arbitrary direction, it seems that all the spin transmitted cannot be read by the inverse spin Hall effect. So this is the uh, very kind of a tricky technical problem broadcast a little bit. Uh, but later on, we realized that this can have a solution because usually we don't really put a strong, uh, uh, we don't really put a very strong um, magnetic field on antiferon magnet to orient the new vector. But actually, if the new vector, uh, the uh, magnetic field is really strong enough, you can make some rotation of the new uh, vector vac effectively. So here we have a JPP, uh, JP paper describing that what the orientation of the new vector will be if you put a uh, strong enough magnetic field on it. So it tells you that it will have some finer rotation even for a kind of low magnetic field now put on here. So here, uh, so for example, look at this five Tesla uh, color. It tells you that if you orient the 
you, uh, the magnetic field out of plane with a tilting angle. So you have a chance to rotate you know, the new vector a little bit away from the C-axis. So this is very good for us. So here we have the in-plane uh, component of YIG, uh, and also we have in-plane component of the new vector. So this can give rise to some um, spin injection, and also we can measure it by inverse spin effect. Then the experiment turned out to be very easy. Just measure the same signal with the tilting angle of the magnetic field at different temperatures. And what we see is that just in this kind of below the new uh, point, in this kind of transition uh, regime, you can, when the new vector is kind of easy to manipulate, you actually, you actually can modulate the transmission of the spin current by kind of 500%. So this, this is pretty kind of a uh, eff kind of effective modulation of the spin transmission. And my boss, uh, H. Saito, he named it uh, spin CMR. But to us, we think we just realized the kind of effective spin current switching in insulator systems. But also we can check our scenario a little bit uh, kind of uh, careful. So by looking at the phase transition regime. So in this regime, we uh, measure this the angle dependence of the uh, inverse spin half act with, with, the, the, or with the field. So just at the new temperature, we get pretty kind of sinusoidal. The behavior this is well expected for this kind of bilayer sample. If you, but when we, when we just cool down a little bit, we find that the head, the peak, and the valley here get flattened a little bit. But when we just further lower the temperature, we find that the symmetry totally kind of changed. So in the beginning, you have a one peak, one dip. So here you have a two uh, peak, two dip. And the position actually is not 90 degree. So this is actually pretty well explained by considering uh, the orientation of the new vector. So for the 90 degree uh, here, so actually it's totally blocked due to uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, orthogonal orientation. But for intermediate, uh, uh, but for this kind of a zero and 180, so it's a kind of a parallel, but you don't have the inverse spin measurable. But it's just for some intermediate uh, orientation, you have both the uh, orientation uh, in plane component of neo vector and, a, and moment. So actually, so you have this kind of a peak. And uh, what is good that all these kind of thing is mesh kind of well fitted by the very easy model. The last thing actually we want to check another thing is that, so we, we attribute all uh, this kind of a sharp behavior of the transition due to, for, to the single crystalline sample. But actually this is not shown in the previous paper. So we repeat this kind of result recently and uh, we find that if you do have an outer plane uh, CX orientation, you have the sharp transition. But somehow if you can grow some sample without the C-axis orientation, so the peak actually become not sharp. So this actually is pretty consistent with our scenario. So the, I think the, from the, uh, I hope I can convince you that the spin current switch can be realized by the new vector rotation in independent insulators. But uh, later, uh, and I also want to say thanks for Peter to write us a kind of an introduction uh, in in the same, same um, issue of the initial material paper uh, journal. And also, very, very similar result is reported by uh, the Cloy group, pretty, uh, I think one month or two months later after our publications. And recently we have a kind of easy kind of perspective published here, and maybe you can read for some information. And last, I would like to show that something not well understood at all. So this is a collaboration between the QLab and us and in, uh, in Berkeley. So actually, they managed to measure the AC transmission of a spin current in this kind of material. So they grow uh, permoy and, uh, and cobalt and another uh, iron, iron cobalt into this kind of uh, trial system. And in this system, one layer, the, actually you can pump spin from permalloy and receive it in this uh, another layer. 
So actually in this material, uh, the, this structure actually, there is two coupling between the two ferromagnet layer. So one is the spin current coupling and the other is interlayer coupling. So, so actually they can distinguish this two kind of coupling by tuning the spacing layers uh, thickness here. So they find that when the silver is pretty thin, so the interlayer coupling is pretty kind of dominant, so you have pretty in-phase uh, procession of the second layer. But what is very puzzling is that when they increase the thickness of, of silver into 10 nanometer, so they find that the coupling is dominated by the spin current transmission. So this is highly non-trivial just because considering that we are pump, we pump in the gigahertz uh, spin current, but this material, carboxide, is pretty much the terahertz material. So we don't, actually we don't expect to see this, but, it's, but the, this result clearly tells you that a coherent AC spin current can go through an antifer magnet without a problem. So this is pretty kind of puzzle problem. And also, please, please note that the orientation between the new vector and the, the, uh, the, the injector uh, magnetization is 90 degree. It's <coughs> according to the, our result in uh, chrome oxide, this is not likely to happen. So this is pretty puzzle for us. And also they further show that the precession of the new, uh, the new vector here is not happening. So it's not because the new vector precession in the gigahertz range to just to, to make this transmission ha happening. So what, we also have some similar result in uh, coboxide. Made... Oh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah, this is my, my last slide. So, okay, just a thanks to everyone contributing here. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, okay, thanks. Okay, you explained everything by saying, okay, you align the principle of your new air vector, yeah. pulling that to the... Uh, uh, Osorg node, yeah. Well, ah. you have a spin transport through the air vector. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's pulling that to the uh, heat marking And if yeah. you have the problems to measure then, they are really uh, particular to play the inverse remote. Yeah. So you have to kill Yeah, this is the problem. Um, this is one thing to check it. The other thing to check it is also the frequency. So we know that the frequency of, uh, of the resonance and anti power markers um, is quite higher than in, in the FMR. Yeah, yeah. Another explanation of it was if you measure, could it be that actually when you have FMR excitation, you actually heat up at the same FMR excitation, for example, local, uh, at this frequency. And what you get if you apply a strong field at the time where the magnetization is susceptible to your magnetic field, the anti But at this time you get a thermal spin vector, the time of the oh, I see. Because also this will follow the same uh, angular dependence. Uh, actually, it's not. I can answer the question pretty easily. Uh, so actually, we really consider this. So if you consider that kind of a scenario, you have to say that, okay, the ferromagnet, this kind of a tuning, the uh, ferromagnetization will be kind of uh, if responsible for this signal, right? But here we just show that actually, the dip so if your scenario works, actually the dependence will not be like this. So for example, uh, let's say for this uh, configuration, you still have the, this kind of tuning angle. The strong magnet field is there, it's, it's still there. So actually, effectively, you still have some of this kind of tuning, and effectively, you have a ferromagnet component right here. But if you look at the data, so this the value is smaller than this value. So then, I think, in this way, I think your scenario does not work here. Right. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I well, like to... It tilting. tilting. The, uh, and also, the meditation appears. 
So this two, two uh, peaks appear uh, because uh, you need to also take into account the sum zero magnetization. This two peaks does affect the answer to be of the antiphon. So it's a combination, yeah, it's also, yeah. It's, it's a combination of two geometrical effects. First, uh, rotation of antiphon magnetic vector in the magnetic field, and plus projection of uh, the uh, thus induced spin polarization of the um, direction in which you can measure the spin polarization. So you explained uh, between the X pin and the uh, orthogonal to your hill vector, it cannot penetrate. But I think there must be certain finite penetration gaps. Your spin cannot relax immediately. Um, so. Okay, according to the data, actually, we have to say it's, if it's perpendicular, it will relax within at least a seven nanometer. So it's pretty efficient. So seven, seven nanometer, at least according to the data here, we can say, yeah. And another thing is that is think about the um, kind of uh, decay length of, um, okay, let's say uh, like SMR. So I think SMR is kind of a reciprocal kind of uh, process of this one. And I think for SMR, even you have a kind of a one or two nanometer, you can have the SMR, right? 